Welcome to this zero border cost earnings call. Uh, you would have seen the results which we just published. The key points there are our volumes have grown by 5.5% for the quarter. Within that, market share for dealer segment has improved year on year. And overall market share in the motorcycles have been maintained. Our revenue has grown 8.6%. And within this, past business has grown 24%. EBITDA margin is at 15.2% while dropping sequentially 40 basis points, but displays the resilience of our portfolio and also our ability to navigate through cost and other headwinds, given our strong brands and the portfolio. Our profit after tax at 976 crores is up compared to 909 crores of quarter one sequentially. So with this, we open the call for questions. Sure, thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking questions. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. We have the first question from the line of Kapil Singh from Namura Securities. Please go ahead. Hi, sir. Um, couple of questions. Firstly, on demand side, uh, there have been uh, some cost increases because of insurance. So just wanted to check, uh, um, you know, in light of that, does your full-year industry growth outlook of double-digit remain intact? Also, if you can share some color on festive demand for first few days, how does it compare on a YOY basis or, uh, you know, like-to-like -like period? Uh, growth. Uh, second question is on the other expenditure. Uh, we have seen a significant increase on a QOQ basis, so some color on what exactly has happened there um, and how do you expect to shape up? So let me uh, start this and I then hand it over to uh, uh, Sanjay. Uh, on other expenses, uh, you should look at on a half yearly basis and not on quarter on quarter basis because in quarter one call also we had said that when you had asked, the uh, expenses are lower, uh, and we had talked about the phasing. Uh, so as you see, in quarter two, uh, the expenditures are phased higher. And therefore, if you look at on a half-year basis, there is not so much of a difference as far as percentage to revenue is concerned. On the demand side and all the sort of stuff, let me hand it over to Sanjay uh, to answer that. Yeah, thanks, Kapil. Um, yes, I guess uh, we all know about what's happening right now. Uh, there has been this uh, impact from insurance side. It softened the demand at least, but I think specific to your question in terms of whether our annual outlook will stand change, etc. No, I don't think we'll take a short-term view of these things. Uh, clearly, uh, there are these kind of hiccups and setbacks that happen every once in a while. Uh, so I guess um, as leaders, we need to also understand that uh, the context of these setbacks is more temporary than in, in nature than permanent. Uh, so we do see while there's a bit of softening on demand side, uh, it's more flattish than growth at this stage, but we do expect things to turn around and move forward. Um, and we are expecting, like we've said earlier, uh, still hopeful for an 8 to 10% growth in the first of season. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Before we take the next question, We'd like to inform participants that in order to ensure that the management can, is able to address questions from all participants in the conference, please limit your questions to two per participant. The next question is from the line of Raghunandan from MK Global. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, sir, for the opportunity. Uh, just wanted to understand that, uh, um, firstly, on the cost side, commodity inflation, uh, adverse currency, and also increasing competition. So uh, is there any, um, you know, like, have we been limited in terms of our ability to take price hikes? And just wanted to understand, like, in the coming quarter, uh, what kind of margin impact is expected? That is first question. Uh, secondly, sir, on the... Uh, uh, working capital side, uh, there has been an increase in uh, data days, and uh, so just wanted to know your thoughts. It's, is it mainly because of the festive season? Right. 
Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, so as far as the cost and currency, commodities, there's a lot of questions loaded into one. Uh, what I would like to answer is, first of all, no one can forecast what the commodity will be or currency will be tomorrow. We've been maintaining that. What we need to see is that as far as the past is concerned, the last few quarters, as you've seen, costs have been going up. Uh, we've been managing it judiciously uh, through various things. We've been taking price increases as appropriate. Plus, we've also been doing our saving program, and we've been growing volume in order to get operating leverage as well. So these are the ways in which we have been navigating our margins, and therefore, that's the way that we see us also moving forward. Whatever price increases we have been taking, uh, those are being absorbed in the market, but obviously, we do a very sensible uh, increases from time to time. And uh, so that's what I would say on the margin part. Can't give a short-term outlook on what will happen to margin, et cetera, et cetera. Our long-term guidelines still remain that our decisions are guided by the tram line of 14 to 16 percent margin, and that helps us in terms of navigating through a profitable growth uh, for our decision. As far as working capital is concerned, it is seasonal. You are absolutely right, uh, because as the stocks move up uh, in the festive season ahead of the demand, therefore, we need to finance a bit, and therefore, the debtors' days go up. And that essentially is just a seasonal thing and not any underlying change in our working capital nature. Uh, so just a clarification, sir. Based on the uh, commodity and currency movement last two, three months, uh, do you think that whatever price hikes has been taken uh, is enough to absorb it or would more be required in the next two, three months? I mean, in, in the sense, would you be taking more price hikes, say, in January? All the price hikes will depend on how the commodities pan out in the future. Uh, you have already seen the price hike that we took in October, uh, first week. Uh, and basically, it's been with a lag of a quarter. But with the lag of the quarter, we've been able to cover our cost increases. Moving forward, depending on how the commodities pan out, we'll have to take decisions accordingly. Thanks. Thanks for that explanation, sir. That was very helpful. Uh, that's all from my side. Thank, Thank you. you. The next question is from the line of Ashish Nigam from Axis Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, so, you know, a couple of questions on the financing side. If you can just remind us again, uh, what percentage of our volumes are financed? Uh, and within that, how much by NBFCs, how much by Hero FinCorp, etc.? I'll ask Mr. Uh, Chabra to answer that question. Yeah, all of the balances for in the market for you know, a number of things, 36.5%, out of which 11% is from Hero Pencop Limited. Sorry, I missed the first number. Um, what percentage is financed? 36.5%. 36.5%, okay. Overall, which financing is for Hero Pencop. And 11% from Hero Pencop. Okay, and the remaining also are mainly NBFCs? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, NBFCs have been talking a lot about the margin pressures and liquidity issues. Are we seeing that on the ground? Is that led to any softness in demand? So, uh, on the NBFC part of it, if your question is related to Hero FinCorp or question related to the their ability to finance two-wheelers? The ability to finance two-wheelers, NBFCs beside Hero FinCorp. No, no, no. We've not seen any impact on that uh, in terms of financing penetration. Okay. And in light of this, what is the plan now for Hero Vivian Corp? I, we are at 41% stake now that with this 250 crore investment, how has that changed? No, this was a rights issue. So therefore, okay. everyone uh, subscribed in an equal measure. Our right. stake has just mathematically gone up by 10 basis points, so which is not meaningful in any way because everyone subscribed. Uh, so the stake broadly remains the same. And the plans of this 11% of our sales being Hero FinCorp, is there any plan, you know, three years out or something that you can share? No, it's difficult to give a forecast on that. Uh, all we can say is that Hero FinCorp continues to grow, not just from two-wheeler, but also overall as a company in terms of their loan book size. And also while the NBFCs are impacted, uh, uh, as you yourself mentioned, on liquidity, etc., uh, Hero FinCorp has been served well because of its rights issue. Uh, so they have enough liquidity uh, to fund their growth as of now. 
Got it. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Karthik Chulappa from Bonavista Fund Management. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you for the opportunity. So my first question is uh, on our uh, meeting. I'm sorry term, to interrupt uh, you, Karthik, but we can barely hear you. Could you please speak a little louder? Uh, sure. Is this better? Yeah. Okay. So my first question is on our uh, medium-term uh, capacity expansion plan. So as I understand it, with the Andhra plant coming online, the first phase sometime, let's say, towards the end of 2019, our capacity goes up to almost about 11 million units. Given that the industry itself is set to see two important uh, events, one is the ABS-CBS coming up in 2019 and the BS-6 in 2020, uh, are there any plan to either push back those capex in view of how the demand will play out uh, beyond uh, the FI-19? So first of all, uh, uh, as Sanjay pointed out, uh, we still see demand uh, growing at 8 to 10 percent, right? Because the macro fundamentals of Indian economy in general and two wheelers of auto sector in particular still remain intact, right? It is for the players like us and others to navigate through these headwinds appropriately. So that's one. Second thing is in terms of therefore the capacity expansion also um, uh, uh, basically uh, uh, displays our confidence in our demand projection. Third thing is the, with Andhra, the capacity doesn't go up to 11 plus. It actually goes to 10 plus by end of next year. Although both these plants, which is Andhra and Gujarat, if need be, can be scaled up to actually move to 11. So, therefore, that's the plan, and we feel that the plan is a very balanced uh, plan in terms of the, um, the capacity expansion, and we don't see any need to push out the capex. And the other thing is that the underlying penetration levels, when we talked about the demand, uh, so those are the stories. You know, you talk about the MSP increase, uh, more income with the, with the, with the farmers, you talk about underlying growth of Indian economy at 7% plus still. You talk about consumer credit, uh, financing opportunity. You talk about under penetration. So all those are macro stories, and they all remain intact, despite whatever the short-term headwinds could be. So in nutshell, uh, we don't, we still still have confidence in the demand growth, and therefore the capacity expansion will continue. So we're not going to push back any of the capital. Uh, perfect. So my second question is, uh, earlier you had mentioned that uh, you're, at this point of time you're not feeling uh, any pressure from any of the NBFCs who are actually financing two-wheelers. But in case, uh, let's say over the next month or so, uh, if any of your main NBFCs experience any issues, would you have like a plan B so that you don't lose out on the festive sales or festive demand? We don't see that at all. If at all the financing percentages, we expect it to only go up. If you study the NBSP problem that is there, it will be with a large corporate loan rather than the smaller consumer loan. So it's more about their asset liability mismatch where they have the short-term financing which they have done, uh, borrowing, and they have done a long-term, uh, 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 what you call, lending. Now, these are not long-term lending. These are just 24 months of uh, EMI that they work with. The NBFC problem is of five years, seven year, ten years lending with a one year and two year borrowing. So this is a this is a margin creating segment for them, and a segment where they just need to finance for two years. And we've even seen the percentages actually moving up. So we actually don't foresee any problem, uh, not even in the festive season, but even for the medium term. So your new launch pipeline also would remain unaltered. Absolutely unaltered. Okay. Thank you very much. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Next question is from Ruchit Mehta from SBI Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Uh, Ruchit Mehta from SBI Mutual Fund. You may go ahead with your question. Your line is at top. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so you said that uh, you still have 8 to 10 percent full year volume growth guidance uh, or an outlook. Uh, but just to better understand that, uh, if, as you said, that there has been some flatness in demand per se, and if the festive seasons continue to see that, uh, do you think that uh, you would look at more of uh, 
uh, incentives, whether they be discounts or whether they be promotions or schemes, etc., to sort of try and push to the volumes, uh, or would you just let market uh, forces determine how volumes really play out? We will see how it plays out, and obviously, as key leaders and key players in the market, we, as I said, we'll keep balancing and keep watching this space closely. Uh, Sanjay, would like to add anything on this space? Yeah, um, Richard, thanks for the question. I think uh, it's an it's an interesting question, which also opens up uh, a little bit of a window for us to explain to you exactly what's playing out in the market. Now, this whole insurance thing obviously has uh, created a bit of dampness. Like I said, it's uh, the first few days have been, because the question then was very specific, the first few days have been flattish. And I think most of it is over to the kind of, you know, sit back or some sort of shock, that preliminary shock that increased insurance did lead to. Now, what I also mentioned that we'll continue to grow at a steady 8 to, you know, still expect an 8 to 10 percent growth in the festive season. So we do not see a flattish festive season. We do see an improved, uh, you know, festive season from here on. Uh, the issue on uh, whether that will stay fast, uh, you know, fat uh, doesn't arise because we do we are reasonably confident that things will turn around. There is obviously over the last two three days we have seen some clear, clear improvement in terms of people walking in. The whole piece of this um, insurance being absorbed is also very important. Uh, for instance, the way we've tackled it, and I'm sure that's the way most people are tackling it. Uh, it's also um, you know kind of reflecting in the uh, in in the financing that is happening. Obviously, there's been a slight improvement in the contribution of funds over the last five, six days. Uh, you know, the net impact of the insurance increase uh, to an EMI, a 24-year month, 24-month EMI, uh, is about 200 odd rupees on a 45,000 ticket size. So, so that's what it is. So, therefore, it's been taken care of adequately, and we do expect to restore the confidence back in the market. The fundamental, uh, you know, uh, macroeconomic drivers are very, very robust, and that's what. All of us uh, us must understand, and we recognize that, and we do believe that there will be uh, a significant improvement as we get into the season, in the middle of the season. So, there you are. I think we should have a good, decent season. I think the momentum will continue from there on. And just to add to what Sanjay said, uh, some part of these early days of the first five weeks is also because of the confusion. So, one is the amount of the uh, insurance and Sanjay are talking about. The other is clarity in the market because the insurance first came. It was five years accidental. Then we represented, then it moved back to one year. And therefore, all this clarity around customers that, okay, has it settled or is there more to be, more to happen there in that field, etc. As the communication is going out, people are becoming clearer. And that's why the confidence is that we are just first five, six days. There's still 25, 26 days of the, of the festive to go. And as it's becoming more and more clear, uh, the customers have started working. Okay. Okay. And if you could just give us some update on the scooter portfolio, particularly with regards to the 125cc products, uh, that would be helpful. Sorry, what? Yeah, scooter portfolio. Uh, we, we've talked about two of our 125ccs getting launched in the season, yes, of course. Um, what we are doing is um, uh, we'll see them shortly um, in the market. Uh, we obviously will be launching one after the other to space them out so that there is enough room and uh, space in the market for consumers to actually experience both. Uh, both are as per schedule, and uh, like we've mentioned earlier, there is a lot of resident uh, you know, excitement in the 125cc segment. As you know, the scooter market, as it is, is not been growing very well. But within that, uh, in fact, uh, the growth in the 125cc sub-segment of the scooters is 77% for the uh, first half. So, we are getting into into the segment which is is perhaps is driving whatever is happening in scooters. The entire action is there, so we are getting there. So, and the launches are as per plan. Okay, so, so there's been no delay on the launch because I, I I thought I mean my understanding was this, this would have been launched by the now Navratri festival would have kicked in. Like so said, last time around, it'll be um, you know alongside or around the festive time. So it may not necessarily have been before the Shera or whatever, but we are getting into a situation where we probably will be launching them in a paced manner over a period of 15, 20 days, starting maybe Monday, Tuesday. Okay, fair enough. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Aditya Makarya from Motilalo Swal Asset Management. 
Please go ahead. So, uh, if you could give some color on the extreme, uh, you know, how is the, the 200cc bike, so how uh, are we launching it, how nationwide, and what's the response to it? And uh, secondly, uh, just some color on the other income being higher this quarter. So, I take the question on other income first, and then thereafter, I want to convey to explain on the extreme. Uh, as far as other income is concerned, it's higher as you've seen. Uh, other income comprises of... Uh, also, income uh, from uh, interest on dealers, it is on our investment portfolio, but it also has interest on various deposits and also interest on the income tax deposit. So, this quarter has had a couple of assessments uh, which got cleared and therefore the deposit, uh, interest on deposit from income tax also came in and which led to actually a part of the rise is also attributed to that. Um, Sanjay, on the extreme. Yeah, on the extreme, I think uh, we are extremely... Uh, right now quite excited about the way it's been received by consumers. Um, uh, we've kind of sold about 6,000 thus far. Um, I think in a short period, we've gone national now. Uh, so the, the the most important part is that the overall acceptance of the format, the overall acceptance of the brand, the overall communication, and the positioning of the stream, I think that's all coming into the right place. It's now about time when the consumers will start, you know, the inquiries or the excitement will convert themselves into sales. So we're quite uh, hopeful and we're very excited about the prospects of Extreme. Like we said last time, it's not just going to be left to one model in the segment to do the job. It will have a lot of brothers and sisters coming along shortly. And we do expect over the next three to four months, the entire premium segment portfolio for us will look perhaps the smartest of them all, as, as, as we would like to put it. So I think the whole excitement is coming back into the game and, uh, the fact that Extreme had a very difficult job to do, which was virtually relaunch um, Hero Motor Corp into the premium segment. I think it's doing it very ably. Um, you will see some more action happening very soon. Sure. And, and lastly, sir, with Bajaj, you know, launching that triple five offer, I don't know what festive scheme they are. Uh, how are we reading that and are we reacting in any way? We said that before as well. Um, we don't, uh, we, we choose not to respond to what competition does. I think uh, I'm sure that they must have thought through whatever they're planning to do, and I'm quite. Um, I expect that um, they, whatever the scheme is, will do well for them. Uh, we can only wish them good luck. But uh, beyond that, I really can't say much. Uh, like I said, the overall mood during the festivities in the first few days, because uh, I was answering, responding to a question earlier, has been pretty lukewarm. You know, it's been flattish at best, and uh, we've seen that trend right across all competition. Uh, anything doing slightly better than others. Uh, so one wouldn't be able to really comment on any specific scheme, whether for, you know, competition or somebody else. That's, that's and by the way, just to add, out of the three fives, uh, while not commenting specifically any competition, but we have two fives permanently, which is five free service and five-year warranty. So <laughs> yes, there's only one five probably you can talk about. Right. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. The next question is from S. Natraj from Quantum Advisors. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, in a scenario of uh, petrol being close to 90 rupees and Hero being known for its fuel efficiency and fill it, shut it, forget it mindset of consumers, are you recalibrating your product launch in this backdrop of higher oil prices? Um, so is there a you know, you know, reflection of thought process on launching premium products and stuff like that? Is there going to be some rethinking on that? Thank you. That's one. And second, on the export side, um, <clears throat> compared to our aspirations, um, we know that you're running behind, um, but there's some catch-up being done because of the market. What do you see over the next couple of years, your aspirations on the export side? Thank you. Right. So on the first part, which is uh, uh, petrol leading to deferral of premium or, 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 the, or the vehicles which are less fuel efficient, Actually, if you look at it, I mean, the overall fuel consumption uh, in a month probably on, on a motorcycle would be maybe 1,000, 1,500, or even 2,000 if you have to go to a premium sort of stuff. And if you take even a 10% increase in petrol, that is of 100 rupees, 150 or 200 rupees in a month. Uh, really speaking, uh, that's not a lot when you take a monthly expenditure level. So first of all, we don't see that impacting uh, demand or that should impact our launches in any which way. So we will be proceeding with the launches in any case. Uh, as far as the exports is concerned, 
this quarter, uh, the export growth has been good. Uh, having said that, uh, we will continue to scale up in the relevant markets of export. Uh, and uh, Bangladesh is doing well for us. Uh, equally, there's a Central American cluster which has done well for us, and the growth of uh, quarter two uh, in exports has been close to around 25-26 percent. Uh, so I think, but it's a, it's a build, which is a slow build, but slowly and steadily we are building up uh, as far as our export business is concerned. Okay, and just, to, just to follow up on that export part, you know, the, can you just share the Bangladesh uh, year-to-date volume, if it is possible? Uh, we don't share market-wise volumes, but you can take it offline with Obam separately okay. uh, if you have to. And, and the, the effective trust, tax rate uh, guidance for the longer term? Sorry? The tax rate guidance for the long term? So we don't give tax rate guidance for the long term, uh, but uh, I would say that by and large, you know, there was a big impact of the Haridwar fiscal expiry, and uh, that is already built into our tax rate. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And just to add to it, Natraj, on the, on the lighter side, mm -hmm. uh, given the fact that we are virtually not present in the premium segment, uh, I think that should be something of concern, if at all, uh, to most of the players who are pretty well entrenched there. For us, it's a win-win game because we just have to keep launching our new model and get some market share. I think that's where we, uh, that's how we should see it. Okay. Beyond that, really, um, fuel prices and the impact it has across various customer segments, I think uh, premium consumers generally aren't uh, as influenced by such things because they obviously are a little more agnostic to such changes. Now, what impacts is clearly um, other segments. And if anything, uh, we've seen historically, I think you started your question with that. Whenever there is a price increase in fuel, uh, one of the biggest beneficiaries is companies like Hero because obviously because of our lineage on mileage and our uh, capabilities to deliver extremely high levels to our customers, we've always benefited from such issues. So we do see that as a positive thing in any case. So on the demand side, we don't see any adverse if at all. Absolutely. Yeah. I appreciate it. Wish you all the best. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Hitesh Goel from Kotak Securities. Please go ahead. Hello, sir. Can you just uh, share some demand patterns across uh, north, uh, west, south uh, regions of India? Um, uh, because I think UP was a big growth market uh, for you guys, uh, UP, MP, Rajasthan, and you know Bihar as well. Can you just give us some sense of market-wise uh, or region-wise demand trends? We don't give geography-wise or region-wise demand trends, but overall basis, let me ask Sanjay. Yeah, I think it's the way you need to look at it is very simple. Uh, for markets which are underpenetrated, the growth will continue to be very robust, both in the short term, medium term, and in the long term. And I guess the names of markets that you took are highly underpenetrated. So these markets will continue to keep rocking, I think. And we are extremely strong in these markets and continue to strengthen ourselves even further. Uh, so to that extent, markets which are far more evolved and have higher level of penetration, uh, the growth rates will always be, obviously, comparatively and relatively speaking, will be much lower. So, yes, you're right. I think you answer your own question. Okay, sir. And, sir, uh, just a follow-up on this, sir. Basically, we, uh, you know, heard that, you know, there are a lot of companies which are coming in the electric bike segment, especially in UP. Uh, I was surprised to hear that a place called Azamgarh also has five companies which have launched electric uh, two-wheelers there. Uh, any plans from Hero to launch uh, its own product in electric? Because uh, it may surprise companies in a big way uh, in, in the coming 12 months, in my view. Right. So, so first of all, uh, look, EV is not going to be a short-term story. Uh, EV is going to be a medium to long-term story. Uh, second thing is uh, we are ensuring they will not get the price. And that's why we have a twin strategy, which is one, uh, we've invested in startup called Aether. You would have seen they have launched scooters in Bangalore. We have 30% stake in that. The other is our own R&D center is also working on it. So rest assured, we won't be surprised on it. We are working on it. But equally, it's not an overnight or a 12-month story. It's going to be a medium to long-term story because a lot of stuff on EV needs to be sorted out, uh, both from the private side, government side, infra side, customer side, convenience side, design side, before really EV can take off. Okay. And so finally, can you give me dealer inventory on overall level right now? No, so we don't give specific inventory-wise, but suffice it to say that we run on four to six weeks of forward demand. Okay.
great sir thank you thank you the next question is from jatin chawla from credit swiss please go ahead yeah hi good evening sir thanks sir, for the opportunity uh, the first question is on uh, could you quantify the uh, the import exposure that you have uh, on both the direct and the indirect side uh, by indirect i mean things that your vendors might be importing and when does that kind of hit your pnl is it with a lag of a quarter or a couple of quarters yeah so we won't we don't give out any specific numbers on that as far as direct is concerned uh, it is a small exposure because our exports and imports uh, put together is a natural hedge and then whatever is the rest of the quantum which remains exposed uh, that we are cover on a quarter to quarter basis so that's effectively how we navigate as far as our currency is concerned i think on one of the earlier calls you had called out that the indirect exposure was somewhere in the double digits is it, uh, just wanted to clarify is it still as high or have you done something to bring it down over the last couple of years what is double digits meaning the indirect exposure used to be more than 10% uh, at least 2 uh, 3 years back uh, has the company taken any steps to bring that down over the last 2 3 years or is 10, it is still 10% of the cost you are saying of the cost yeah Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. There, there is no, uh, no bringing down that because that also depends on not just currency, but you have to look at the overall benefit of the landed cost from import from the same vis-a-vis local uh, supply. And really speaking, in case of currency, uh, it, it's not wise. At least what we see uh, is to take a fall on currency. I mean, if you keep switching currencies from one uh, 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 part to the other. and try to actually reduce exposures or try to do only based on currency that doesn't work and therefore what we do is basically we do on a quarterly basis the hedging uh, as far as our exposure is concerned but there is no effort to bring down any kind of direct or indirect exposure purely based on currency right um, and could you quantify the total uh, price hikes that you have taken so far this financial year cumulative so we've been talking about price hikes every quarter so i can't remember all the numbers uh but you can pick up on the previous calls but uh, this time also we took price hike on the ex showroom basis of around 600 to 700 rupees i think that's what we uh, we talked about we had taken around 200 odd in the previous quarter and around 300 odd in the 300 400 odd in the from the first april so you can pick up on the previous calls but those have been the order of uh, price hikes that we've been taking So October was about 600 to 700 rupees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you mentioned some um, one-off element uh, on the other income side. Uh, possible to quantify that? Uh, no, it's not possible to quantify. There are very different elements into that, uh, and therefore we won't be able to quantify exactly the one-off element. It does happen. Those interest on income tax deposits do come uh, in several quarters. So it's not just also one-off. It's one-off in this quarter. It also was there in. I think you see you hold up one of the quarters that then when the assessment keep getting completed uh, the amount accrue and that's what it is Sure thanks all the best Thank you Thank you The next question is from the line of Pramod Amte from CGS CIMB please go ahead Yeah hi uh, want to check uh, do you see any uh, in terms of the demand or the sales momentum for the industry uh, how has been rural versus urban and in terms of the slowdown which you talked is there any distinct pattern between the rural and urban again okay. i think uh, what we've seen thus far i think it's been a fairly consistent uh, thing yeah you could say that rural is a little uh, stronger and uh, uh you know as opposed to the urban thing but it's just about marginally better but what we do expect is that going forward uh given the msp um, you know kind of scenario that we are getting into now uh, there is a clear uh, feel that we are getting from the up country networks and markets that uh, things in rural will start looking uh, northwards uh, even better so that just gives us that extra you know confidence uh, that uh, things will start getting even better in rural um you know going forward so to that extent right now what is visible is almost a similar situation both slightly better in rural but i think from here on things could get even even stronger for rural 
Also, let me just add on, uh, you mentioned the said slowdown, slowdown. We've not said slowdown. We're talking about the first five, six days of festive. Uh, we are talking about the long-term macroeconomic fundamentals remaining strong. We are talking about even the short-term fundamentals remaining strong, which is the MSP, which is all this sort of stuff that's happening, the quarterly economic growth, all that sort of stuff. So six days of festive, really speaking, calling that a slowdown, uh, we don't quite agree. Uh, I think, we, as we said, we still believe that 8 to 10 percent growth, uh, underlying growth momentum is possible. Sure. Thanks for that clarification. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Pranav Tendulkar from Rare Enterprises. Please go ahead. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity. I just wanted to ask how many of your dealerships are you categorizing as winners, average performers, and uh, below average performers? That is one. And to improve that, how frequently are you doing some initiatives like mystery shopping, etc., to assess their performance? And what are the solutions that you provide for dealerships to improve their performance? Yeah. Uh, so, Pranav, uh, I think first of all, it will be. Uh, I don't think it will be fair on our part to share the exact number of dealers not pulling their weight. But yes, I think the question is very relevant to understand as to what is the company is thinking on. How do we really try and bring them around and, you know, improve their performance? So we have an internal system uh, just to share with you, called the MyScore. We track that on a regular basis. It's a balanced scorecard-based system, wherein performance across all parameters, sales, uh, service reporting, service satisfaction, parts, business, and all allied areas uh, are factored in, uh, including any customer complaints or any challenges around that. And that uh, gives us a residual score uh, for each dealer. And the bottom five percentile of all dealers are specially put into a, a dealership improvement plan for which there are various trainings, et cetera. There are various interventions that are done from time to time. So, and, you know, the intent, therefore, is to improve them. We, we are an extremely dealer-friendly company, but we have tried to ensure that uh, performance doesn't come in the way, and therefore uh, we make sure that we are able to pull through most of these dealers. And wherever there is a need, uh, we always look at options of letting such dealers go if there has been a case like that in the past. Uh, right, right. So, so uh, I, I see, so I have myself have uh, done some research on the ground, and the uh, Hero Motorcock is actually very well known for low cost of ownership, total cost of ownership, not just the, you know, initial discounts, right? Right. Uh, and, and this communication is not as effectively coming out in city dealerships. That's what my observation was. Maybe my sample was very low, uh, as it is clear to rural uh, uh, dealers. Uh, are, you, are you doing anything to push this impression? Because these guys are the first and most authentic uh, communicators of your product, right? Yeah. So, uh, so, I wonder if you something like that. Uh, you, uh, so just to kind of uh, understand your question, you're saying that uh, our rural dealers are more aware of this as opposed to the larger dealers? Are you? That's a, that's a question? No, no. So, so it might be also coming out because of the dealer's experience that urban, uh, you know, uh, buyers might be actually concerned about not total cost of ownership, but some different things. I, I, I'm not clear about that, but uh, rural dealers are quite, quite clear about it, that your to total cost of ownership will be very low in Hero as compared to, say, Bajaj or any other competitor. That's right. I, I think... Um there has been a there has been a jury out for a long long time, and I think we always end up this in these kind of uh, chats where people end up thinking that rural customers are not probably as brand brand savvy as they're cost conscious as opposed to the urban customers. But like I said, the jury is still out. I personally believe that rural customers are strongly brand oriented as an as is urban counterpart. I don't think there's any gap in that, um, and that, that's why you know you see the best of best of um, products are actually getting consumed in the rural market. So the whole point is that perhaps there is a very clear uh, driver, which is about total cost of ownership, which needs to be articulated adequately in certain areas, which is a little more sharper in those, maybe defined by your own sampling, like you said, your limited sample size. Maybe in that sample it turned out that the smaller dealers were a little more sharply talking about this thing. And that's whatever is the sales pitch eventually is also a function of what the customer really wants to know more about. Isn't that right? 
So in such markets where if your sample has been skewed, therefore you would not have been able to pick those markets where customers are actually concerned about total cost of ownership being as a core reason. But in terms of our pitch to uh, all our dealers and the communication, we are very clear. Uh, I, first of all, I don't quite agree with the initial discounts. There are no discounts. Hero doesn't offer products on discount. So we are very clear about focusing, and that's been our pitch for a very, very long time because most other manufacturers are available at a discount versus every single product that we have in the category. And therefore, if we have to fight against that, um, and more recently, in the last call, I remember there was a whole bunch of uh, talk about a certain competition and a certain amount of discount, which was going into, you know, maybe 8,000 plus kind of a discount. We didn't, of course, um, I mean, today I'm surprised there's no question on that. But that's a reality. In market, there are competitions which are offering at significant discounts up front. We're still operating in very successfully so. So our pitch has always been not about the initial cost alone. It's been about the total experience and the total cost of ownership across dealerships, across city types, uh, across customer demographics. So uh, maybe the sampling uh, is one, one way I, I can look at the sample probably having been a little screwed. Uh, could be the reason that you have not picked it up. And having said that, I think we are happy that you are picking up this as a core this thing, which we also communicate. And you could always look at enhancing yes. this. Yes, I mean, if you and, can uh, share with uh, the, us those samples, maybe yeah, yeah, we, maybe we need to do a we could to do that. that. And yeah. also the market sometimes is also, we move towards rather than from just total cost of ownership to total value of ownership, Absolutely. which then includes the brand and the price and everything. All right? Right, right. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I think probably I will take it offline. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. It okay. will more into it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Pramod Kumar from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity. Uh, my, uh, I just want a first clarification on the spare parts comment what uh, Niranjan made at the start of the call. Uh, did I hear it right that spare parts growth uh, was around 24% part, part uh, revenue growth this quarter? Yes. Is that right? Yes. Quarter and, 2 versus uh, quarter 2. So that would put it in the number of uh, over 700 crores, right, for the quarter? 713 crores to be precise, I can give you the numbers as well. Oh. Thanks a lot, Niranjan, for that. Uh, and my uh, question on uh, question pertains to the second half outlook uh, on marketing expenditure. Given that you guys are having some amazing uh, uh, launches on the scooter and the premium motorcycle side, uh, uh, is that probably fair to expect that uh, with the festive retail marketing as well in terms of branding and the launch expenses, the marketing intensity will be much more higher in the second half versus the first half? Well, it could go up. Uh, overall, you know, we've always been around two and a half to three percent in terms of our ad and publicity expenditure, and we keep managing within that framework. And we do see us managing within that framework even moving forward. But yeah, and second half could be higher than first half. Traditionally, yeah. yeah, historically it has been like that. The second half does see some action, particularly if your Diwali Dashera falls in the second half, which is the case this year. Last year, of course, Dashera was in the first half. So a lot of expenses got split a little there. But I guess that's traditionally the way the entire auto seg segment and particularly two-wheelers sort of spending in the three and a half. Sounds good. And the uh, second question is on the uh, on the uh, uh, on the market on the exp aspirations on the both the scooter and the premium motorcycle. As we can see, the data on scooter market share, we've been kind of having a five-month uh, straight decline in scooter dispatches. Uh, uh, I guess you're probably setting the ground with uh, very low inventory of the existing models when the new models come in, uh, which is understandable. But uh, how would you see the market share journey for Hero from here on uh, for the next two years? As to is there any aspirational numbers? Because in the past you shared uh, a number numbers which haven't exactly materialized because 100cc segment is not exactly doing well. But as you enter the fast-growing uh, 125cc segment, uh, is there a number which you would put as to where would you like to have your market share back? Like we've done been 20, 15, and now, now we are closer to 11. So is there a number there? And similarly for premium motorcycle, we used to be 12% plus in FI13. Uh, we are down to 1.3%. Uh, so is, what kind of a comeback are we looking at in both the categories? So I'll first start with it, uh, just a minute on this, and then I hand it over to Sanjay uh, for your answer. Uh, but we don't give out a market share ambition number on any of our portfolio uh, because it, it's important to do the right thing, and then the market share will come along. Obviously, in any segment that we would play, we would play to win, yeah, and to get a fair market share. Uh, as far as Scooter is concerned, uh, you've already talked about 125cc launches, and that was the endeavor. Premium would be building portfolio over three to five years and then get to a meaningful market share. What that would be, we want to quantify. Let me hand it over to Sanjay to talk more about the scooter and the premium. 
So, so look, I think uh, it's, this is a very simple answer to your question. I think uh, our growth or our aspiration in both these segments is going to be a function of the, the, the launches that we are going to be having in these segments. And as you, as you already perhaps know, that both these segments are started for some very major action and something that is going to happen very soon, shortly in scooters, followed by some more action in the premium segment. So I guess uh, it's also uh, very important to understand that, you know, uh, first of all, it's not, a, it's not been a tanking story for us in scooters. We have actually improved our market share between quarter one and quarter two. From 12.6, we've gone to 12.9, which is uh, not a bad situation in a market anyways, which has been having a lot of turmoil. If you would have noticed, uh, you know, that scooters are not, have not been doing as well as they have been doing historically. Uh, it's just a segment uh, that we are not operating in within scooters uh, that uh, we're not present, so we can't really count that in. But we are getting there, and that's the market that is really having a fantastic growth, and hopefully that should trigger and supplement our efforts to improve market share. Like Niranjan mentioned, we do not, um, you know, kind of give an outlook on the proposed market share, but I guess you know how she operates, and I'm sure our ambitions are pretty, pretty high and pretty much in the zone and expectation that you have. So hopefully over the next two to three years, in the medium term, we will be certainly well poised to be hitting those numbers. Also, uh, both on premium as well as the first quarters, yeah. Sorry. Also, as this is too high, I mean, let's look at the brighter side promotes uh, that within a space of six months, uh, you are going to see three launches, yeah? One extreme 200, which has happened in premium, the two 125cc, which is going to come. Probably in the last uh, many quarters, you would not have seen this kind of three launches of new products coming in six months. We are building a good platform from here on. Excellent. Uh, great to hear that, and uh, best of luck uh, for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Promo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next question is from Sonal Gupta from UBS Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, sorry, just dwelling on the same question. So, like you mentioned a couple of times on the call, uh, the scooter market has not been doing well. Any thoughts around that? I mean, especially in the light of the fact that you said that urban and rural are not really very different in terms of demand trends. So, could you just throw some light on what's happening in the scooter side? See, I think uh, we uh, partly explained this uh, in the uh, in the last quarter uh, earnings call as well. There are multiple things that seem to be uh, you know happening. One is the base on scooters in the quarter one last year was very high because of the initial fill opportunity post the BS4 BS3 conversions. Uh, so therefore, you know the growth there was uh, slightly muted, but that has continued to be on a bit of a sort of a downturn, I would say. Uh, and I think perhaps uh, there could be multiple reasons. We are also trying to grapple with that. And uh, you know, a couple of things that seem to be uh, indicated from data points is there has been a significant, uh, you know, in the, over the last three years, there has been a very high level of multiple ownership within households uh, that has gone up, you know, incredibly over the last three years. Perhaps that is flattening out, and therefore that is not helping uh, the scooter growth because the scooter in a lot of cases, almost about a quarter of scooter growth was actually determined by, uh, you know, multiple ownership in households. So perhaps if that kind of is flattening out, uh, it's, it's impacting uh, a significant amount of, uh, so it's, it's treating a significant amount. The other thing that seems to be happening is a lot of action around the 125cc, so which is a segment which is growing very fast. We mentioned this last time around that it took almost about 15 years for, or maybe close to 20 years for the motorcycles in case of motorcycles, to move to a 20% or thereabout contribution from the 125cc, while as in scooters is taking less than 10. So a lot of action around probably power and stuff like that, maybe the current scooters, customers are not as excited, they probably are seeking a little more sales. So maybe that movement is happening, maybe multiple ownerships is kind of holding it back. So hopefully we'll watch it a little more carefully. We are not concluding that the scooters are completely out and uh, done and out, but uh, we'll have to watch this a little more closely over the next quarter or so to be able to have a very clear fix on what exactly is going in uh, with the scooter uh, industry. Yeah, thanks. That's very interesting. Uh, just on the other, I mean, just on the motorcycle side also, uh, uh, I mean, like, if I look at the broader trend in the industry on the 100, 110cc, 
really the demand seems to be mo moving more towards the entry level motorcycles uh, i mean not just this year because of the discounting and stuff but even if you look at the, like a 5 6 year trend and the executive or the deluxe as you call it has actually been shrinking of course you've not lost volumes but other players have uh, so i mean are we seeing uh, i mean what uh, that people are just sort of down trading in terms of uh, or uh, how do you see the 100 cc as a segment itself has been shrinking overall in the longer term so i mean uh, just uh, in terms of how do you see the trend going forward on, on a medium term basis and uh, and what does have implications in terms of your margin profile given if entry becomes bigger and bigger i think it's very simple um, you know the pull and push story works here as well a lot of consumers who were migrating scooters the multiple ownership guys uh, were probably picking from deluxe segment uh, i i i would assume one one uh, you know one clear check for you would be that over the next quarter or so if there is an improvement in the deluxe contribution within motorcycles you could clearly conclude that scooter people are holding back and coming back to deluxe motorcycles uh, as far as entry is concerned there's a lot of opportunity out there and there are there's a whole ocean of people who really want to come into motorcycles and the first stop probably would be the entry level bikes um uh, in the, and therefore entry segment will continue to grow because of penetration i've already answered that earlier in a, in a very different context because uh, there is opportunity uh, from a penetration point of view and the first opportunity obviously goes to the entry level bike and also if you look at the uh, uh, you know the growth is uh, uh, the fact in the growth in the end of the growth yeah i mean, I mean if you look at even full year 18 growth yeah i mean executive grew by in double digits 10% plus premium also grew 10% uh yes yeah, but start if you see entry has grown faster and that's also on the back of some of the uh, uh, you know discounting that happened but if you look at a sustaining trend and we mentioned about it, it's a story of many india so you have on the entry bottom of pyramid people clapping off probably the lower price by getting there then you have another middle class which is the entire belly which actually wants to go for a better motorcycle even as their first motorcycle and of course we have great part of it so that's why that's growing and the premium is more an urban stuff where aspirational youth etc which is driving so i think it's a story of many india playing out and we don't actually see one segment uh, getting cannibalized by another segment uh, so we don't see that happen okay great thank you so much that's very insightful thank you thank you thank you the next question is from jamshed dada boy from city bank please go ahead yes yeah, so just one housekeeping question what was your spares revenue for the first half please Uh, the spare revenue for the quarter one was 602 crores and quarter two was 713 crores. So 13 to 15 crores. Yeah. Sorry, first first quarter was 602. 602. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, sir. All the best. Thank you. Next question is from Ashutosh Tiwari from Equiris. Please go ahead. Yeah, sir. Uh, so you mentioned that the financing is around 36 to 37 percent as a whole. But how would that split between say, rural and urban? Will the financing will be higher in urban areas than rural? Financing is bigger than rural. Financing is bigger than rural. Because we have to see that financing available to the white community, and that's why urban financing will always be higher. Yeah, in urban markets, the financing is as high as 55 to 60 percent, uh, while as in rural markets, it's uh, much lower. Uh, just to add on to that, that is actually another big opportunity as far as two-wheeler industry is concerned moving forward in the medium term, because a low level, current low level of rural financing is not going to remain low. All it means is a lot of demand is actually not getting justified because of low level of financing, and that would change. That would change with finance inclusion. That would change with finance penetration. That would change with all the smartphone penetration. uh the bank account all the sort of stuff the credit inclusion the digitalization of that so over a period of time if you look at the next uh, three years or uh then one can see actually this finance penetration will be increasing and that again be a big flip to the uh, flip to the demand yeah. okay but because of the, this increased rated interest you mentioned almost 4000 rupees for interest segment wouldn't that in that rural demand for there the really cash as of now larger portion is cash So will not that impact demand over the near term? Is at least for next four, five, six months. Maybe after that, maybe just uh, you start seeing increase in the financing. 
So actually, if you see uh, the uh, the part of finance or the non-finance, all that is combined affair, which is what you see as of now. And we see, as we explained, it's just been a bit of confusion around this. Yes, there's an impact on the showroom price. Yes, that's why probably the first few days of the festive has been kind of a flat. But we also see now over the last couple of customers walking in. So actually, we see that you know festive is big. The rest of the stuff, because it's not just about an expenditure on a particular thing. Now, it's about do they have enough income and the money in their wallet to actually spend. The story comes from there. And that is intact, whether it's MSP, whether it's economic growth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when you have the money in the wallet, that's the big thing. That's the most important thing. And thereafter, there's a decision to buy. Yes, initially a bit of confusion around insurance. Now people are walking in. Uh, so we still see, as long as people have uh, income part of the story is intact, uh, then the demand will keep going. Next question is from the line of Gunjan Priyatani from J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. Thanks for taking my questions. I just had two follow-ups. Firstly, on the financing penetration, which you touched upon, um, are you seeing some new players in the sense banks coming back to the uh, this segment uh, because there was in general a big withdrawal uh, in 2009-10 and then you've seen the captive NBFCs. Are you seeing the profile change and you're seeing banks more receptive to it and you know look at this segment more seriously now? Yeah, I've had a conversation with a few of the banks on this, and uh, you are right. I mean they are more receptive. Uh, towards this, I think they're increasingly seeing the opportunity space of the consumer financing. Uh, so far, the big banks have relied on corporate financing, and the consumer financing has gone to NBFC. And mm -hmm. increasingly, uh, uh, you can see that the banks are looking at this segment as a business moving forward. And uh, as banks come in and as they can spread their scale, probably they even the interest rate in future may drop the cost of financing that happens today in the rural area. Now, that's not for short term, but I would say that if you were to ask for a three to three or five year outlook, yeah, I would say that I could see banks coming in, I could say the cost of financing coming down, and I could see the penetration increasing. Will it happen in the next three to six months? Maybe not. But medium term, certainly yes. Yeah. And um, Gunjan, I think, uh, again, a very good question, really, because I think from the context of what actually is happening in terms of finance footprint, I think it's not just a case of uh, more people in bigger towns buying more bi bikes or two-wheelers or four-wheelers on finance. It's also about the deeper penetration that finance companies, the footprints, or as they call the geo-limits for each of these towns is expanding rapidly, which tells you one thing, that the, consumer, the confidence of finance companies in terms of securing their funding is increasing rapidly. The financial environment overall in the country is improving uh, dramatically, uh, he, but might sound surprising given the recent context of how corporates have not done well in terms of their own behavior and repayment of dues. But consumers are clearly, at least the two-wheeler consumers are, uh, have, have really given the confidence to a lot of finances. So we see a lot of NBFC. We see a lot of um, cooperative banks. We see a lot of Ilakai Dehati banks, which is basically the rural, uh, regional rural banks, RRB coming out in the open, improving the footprints, increasing the geo limits. So therefore, a lot of consumer confidence is in, uh, increasing, like, and like Niranjan mentioned a short while ago. That's another reason why we think that the overall long-term view of tubular demand uh, is just looking pretty good, because the moment financing improves and increases, it's going to only bring in better, more customers to the fore. And if, if I were to just quote a report of, uh, I think it's a PWC report, uh, the future of India report, very quickly, uh, the finance access of the consumers overall, not talking to wheelers, is 35% mm -hmm. to which is projected to grow to almost 90% in the next 10 years. So there you are in terms of there is enough opportunity as far as the financing is concerned, and we are sure at some point of time it's going to take off. Thank you. Next question is from Nishant Vash from ICSA Securities. Please go ahead. 
Yeah, hi. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Sir, uh, sorry for again asking the question on festive, uh, just because it's quite unique because the cost changes happened on insurance and there was a disruption. Sir, uh, trying my luck, could you give a breakup between, say, what you generally traditionally see the sales in festive during the Navratra period and, say, between uh, the Diwali and then the Hanteras period? historically and I'm coming from this fact that even if say we've l probably lost a few days initially on Navratras, is it possible the consumer kind of shifts his demand cycle to say Dantiras and Diwali and the overall volume growth comes back to as you're highlighting 8 to 10 percent? Uh, is your views on the same? Uh, yeah, that's a nice try Nishant, I must say. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know what, I think uh, we just go with what we mentioned to you short while ago. Uh, these are early days, extremely early days and uh, this is not something that's happened for the first time. It keeps happening cyclically every two to three years. Sometimes the, the share up does a significant job and then uh, Diwali is not as strong. Sometimes the start can be lukewarm or flattish, like I mentioned, and then there is a takeoff subsequently. So all these things even themselves are because, you know, it's like this. You and I decide to buy something during a certain period, and I may not buy it on a Monday or I may not want to buy it on a Wednesday. I might, I might decide that I'll buy it two weeks later because there's something else that has come up. So I guess so long as the mood and the overall larger macroeconomic factors are in place, there is a bit of dampening. We admitted to that. The fact remains that there has been a major setback on account of uh, the insurance play in the month of September. Now it's kind of eased up. But, you know, there's been a month since that thing happened. And I think Niranjan mentioned earlier, it's not only that increase in the insurance which happened in the month of September on 1st September, it's also the confusion created, uh, you know, I'm not going to comment on that, but there was a huge con confusion on five years versus eventually we had to fight it out and get down to one year. So that confusion has led to a little bit of customer unease, I would say, which is kind of now easing out itself. Uh, we've seen some some serious improvement over the last two, three days. So without really, you know, sharing the number, which uh, may not be uh, also, you know, right to do, uh, we do expect that there is going to be a significant improvement from the way things are now uh, to how they will turn out to be at the end of the season. Thanks a lot, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Janesh Gandhi from Motilal Oswal Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, my question pertains to the 125cc scooter launch. Uh, so you're indicating we'll be launching around first week of November. Is uh, that correct? No, I I think what, what I mentioned is we may start off with one market right now because, you know, what happens in this festive time? We don't want to really risk the fact that we supply quantities and they are thin quantities and people really want it across and then we're not able to satisfy those customers. We'll be disappointed. Dealers will be, you know, enraged. We'll be disappointed. We'd rather go and, you know, try and uh, fill up a market because the ramp up takes time. So, and we would uh, accordingly fill up the market in a pipeline of one, one particular cluster of market and then over a period of 15, 20 days open up into other markets and then go with the bank. So, that's how the plan is right now. We are starting off with one, uh, one cluster and fill that up adequately so that they are able to cater to all the festive demand for that scooter and then open up the rest of the country at one shot. Okay, and that will happen from coming Monday? Uh, this would happen between Monday, Tuesday. Uh, of, yeah, the coming Monday, Tuesday. We could start off with one market and then subsequently roll it out to the rest of the country over the next three weeks. Okay, okay. And the second 125 cc scooter would be around uh, Gen 5? That would be uh, maybe, maybe about a month later or something like that. It's really uh, up to us. It's ready. But, you know, to be very honest, we don't want to really complicate uh, the thing because you know, then we'll not be able to give adequate time, adequate build-up, adequate communication prior power to one model. I think it would need a team place as well. Okay, okay. Uh, second question pertains to, uh, uh, to commodity cost. Uh, so in Tokyo, I believe large part of the commodity cost inflation would be in our performance. Do you expect any further inflation on the uh, to reflect in 3Q? Hello? Uh, we seem to have lost the line for the management. I now hand the conference over to Nishant Vash for closing comments. Mr. Nishant Vash? Yeah, yeah, hi. Uh, 
thanks for attending this conference call uh, that will be the end of the call uh, due to the management being dropped out thank you for everyone for joining today